singing this morning. Thank you so much. All right, let's uh, start off in Jeremiah chapter 10 this morning. And uh, we're talking about the communicable attributes of God. We're on part four of uh, this series. And then next week, and probably the week following, I think I'm going to treat the sovereignty of God and God's decrees uh, separately. Uh, just because of the nature of both of those particular um, attributes of God, or character of God, uh, these are things that cannot and will not uh, change uh, as far as God's sovereignty and his decrees are concerned. So today's short lesson is going to deal with truth and wisdom. Truth and wisdom. And one of the interesting things about studying out theology, and we're, we're kind of in an interesting stage in Christianity in general, and I talk about the importance of doctrine, and I had a thought this morning as I was just going over my notes, and I was thinking, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about the practical aspect of Christian living, you know, you know, live a pious life, the do's and don'ts of the Christian life. But how often do we ask, what, what undergirds the practical side of our life? What, what motivates us? What instructs us or guides us as far as the practical things? Why do we do the practical things? Why should we care? And I contend that having a theological undergirding will help us in understanding why the practical things and the how of practical things. It's one thing to get up and make a bunch of suggestions or demands or you know so on but it's an entirely different thing when you undergird those things with theology and having an understanding of God who he is his holiness his righteousness his justice mercy and grace will go a long way in helping us to understand the whys and hows and the do's and don'ts of the thing and it's not just a matter of you know the man of God says it transitions to well, here's what God says. Here's how God feels. And the closer that we get to God, the more we want to or desire to submit to him in our life and service to him. So today we're going to talk a little bit about truth and wisdom. And I wanted to start off here in Jeremiah chapter 10. There is one true God who is eternally true. There's only one true God. The notion that is put out by the world, it says there are many gods, there are many ways of believing, there are many paths to the top of the mountain, so to speak. That is error. It's wrong. It's false. It's not true. There is one true God, Jehovah God. Amen. And the Bible is pretty clear on that. In Jeremiah chapter 10, and beginning of verse number 10, the word of God says, but the Lord is the true God, period. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. So there's a lot just in verse number 10 that separates the God that we adore, the God that we love, the God that we worship from all the false gods of the world. First of all, he's the true God. To the exclusion of the other gods that claim truth or relevance, he's the one true God. Amen. He's the living God. Amen. He's not an idol that I put on my dashboard. He's not an idol that I have on my mantle at home. He's not an idol that I go and travel to a foreign land and worship and sacrifice to. He is the living God. Amen. He's an everlasting king. It shows his, uh, that he is... Um, uh, the potentate, the king, the ruler, the leader over all. And it has his wrath and no other uh, shall the earth itself tremble. And then look at verse number 11. Thus shall you say unto them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. There's going to come a time, a uh, day of reckoning, if you will, or a day of wrath, if you will, a day of cleansing, restoration, and complete and total reconciliation to God. And all of these false gods that have been erected by fallen man 
uh, will cease to be as Christ rules in perfect leadership and authority and righteousness. And so the truth of God includes his veracity or truthfulness in his declarations concerning himself, the things that he says, and we find those in his revealed word. Uh, so God, um, in whatever he declares himself to be in the Bible, cannot be less than true. And I realize that I'm kind of stating the obvious, but it's good to be reminded sometimes to kind of realign ourselves with the God that we worship. He is true, and he can't do anything or say anything that's contrary to his nature or to his promises. How often do we think about that? Psalm 31, verse number 5, the verse says, Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. And think about the, the two things being connected there in that verse. God has redeemed me, and he's a God of truth. And as you think about it in the context of your salvation, think about the context of your salvation in terms of the benefits, the things that happen. We call that body of knowledge soteriology, the study of our salvation, justified, sanctified, glorified, we're regenerated, born again, predestined, adopted into the family of God. All those things fall under the umbrella of God's promises. And God is a God of truth. And here's what Spurgeon says about this verse, and I quote, Redemption is a solid base for confidence. David had not known Calvary as we have done, but temporal redemption cheered him, and shall not eternal redemption yet more sweet, sweetly console us? Past deliverances are strong pleas for present assistance. What the Lord has done, he will do again, for he changes not. He is a God of veracity, faithful to his promises, and gracious to his saints, he will not turn away from his people, end quote. So God's testimony is true not only about himself, but the whole of creation, and in particular, what he says about man. We're going to get into, down the road in this study, we're going to talk about the study of man. And we're going to go into man's fall, man's nature, the tendency of man apart from Christ, man's responsibility under the umbrella of Christ. And th these are things that are seriously compromised today in many liberal and modernistic churches. And of course, the world has its psychological and philosophical take on man's issues, why man is the way he is. And the further that people depart from what the Bible says about these things, the worse things are going to get. And we see that clearly in our culture, morally and spiritually speaking. The further they get away from the God of the Bible, then the worse things will inevitably get. And so, and the other thing I, I, I wanted to bring up here too, and I know I brought it up the last couple of weeks, is we understand that God is true, but we also have to take into account our corrupt nature yeah. and how we perceive the things of God. And I talked about faith and mercy and grace and love, and while we may have those attributes that are communicated to us, uh, we exercise them in an imperfect way because we're in an imperfect body living in an imperfect world. Someday we will be glorified and all those things will be perfected. And the same thing holds true for truth. God is perfectly true in every aspect of his character and nature and everything that he says. But sometimes our interpretation of that might be off or flawed. Hence our dependence on the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us into all truth. And his word obviously plays a big role in how we uh, interpret that and how we live for him. Uh, Romans chapter 1, we won't turn there, but talks of those who knew not God changed the truth of God into a lie. We see this time and, time and again in the world as we bring the gospel message to the world, as we bring the message of Christ to the world. They have an interpretation of who they want God to be or think God should be. They have an interpretation spiritually that is significantly different than what God has laid out in the scriptures. They have an understanding of Christ, his word, morality, that is flawed, corrupted, polluted, and certainly goes in the opposite direction of the command in scriptures to live a separated, sanctified, and holy life. And then we get into the philosophical aspect of it and 
pretty much lines up with what Pilate said. Uh, what is truth? Many of them have no real standing as to what that is. And so they speculate and argue and debate as to what truth is. In reality, what we have here is the truth. We have God's word is the truth. We worship a God who is truth. We worship Jesus Christ who is truth. And uh, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us who is also truth. Amen. Our nature um, teaches that God is true. And what I mean by that, I mentioned this before, the sense of divinity or sensus divinitatis, there's that little flicker of light in man that knows that there is a God. That's just, you know, it's not a light unto salvation, but it can certainly pave the way and create a, a desire, a, a thought, an acknowledgement. Even the denial of God is, in a sense, a recognition that there is a God. And so we see those texts. Actually, let's turn there real quick. John 17, the Gospel of John 17. John chapter 17. And uh, but I'll just begin in verse number 1. Uh, verse number 3 is the key text here. So verse number 1, the Bible says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. What did I just read from Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10 through 11? He is the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And we jump ahead to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John 5. And verse number 19, I'll read verse 19 through the, through the end, and then verse 20 is the key verse here. And, you know, that should be in your notes as well. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. See how many times the truth is mentioned there in that text? Okay, so some things we're going to talk about with re relation to God as being the God of truth. I won't turn to all the texts, so you have them in your notes that you can turn to them. But let's look at Hebrews, so just back up a little bit to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. We talked about the immutability of God. That's a word I like to use. It's a biblical word. We're going to read it in a moment. And here we have, beginning of verse number 17, so Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 17, the word of God says, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. Verse 18 is key here, that by two immutable things, Mutability. When we think of immutability as it relates to God, it means God cannot change. Okay? He is the same God from everlasting to everlasting. Okay? So that by two immutable things in which it is impossible. See what it says there? It is impossible for God to lie. So he can't lie in his promises and statements concerning man, salvation, and so on and so on. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. I'll, I'll sum this up, although much more could be said. Because God cannot lie, we should find comfort. Amen. Amen. That's it. Let's sum it up. Because God cannot lie, we should find comfort in his word to us. Amen. And how often have we been failed? How, long have, uh, how often have we been let down by those within this world who have lied to us. 
And yet here we are worshiping, praising, and serving, and learning about a God who cannot change. He cannot lie. It is impossible for him to do so. Now jump back to Titus, and then you can look up Numbers 23 on your own, but it's consistent with this fact that God cannot lie. So Titus chapter 1, and I wanted to read these because of the context. Titus chapter 1, the Bible says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life. And we're not hoping for eternal life. Our hope is eternal life. In other words, we're looking beyond this realm, the temporal realm, and we're like Paul. We're setting our affections on things above. We're pressing toward the mark, the prize of the high calling. We know that we're going to heaven. We know there's a place that has been prepared for us, and we know that is where Jesus is. That is our hope. And so he says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And so as it relates to our salvation, this all was taken care of and designed and uh, set up or established in eternity past. And so they must, because of his nature and promises, they must come to pass. And so as we roll down uh, the list of things here, God's works are done in truth, Psalm 33, verse number 4. God's word is higher than man's word, Romans chapter 3, verse number for Christ, who is God, is called faithful and true. Let's turn there real quick. Revelation 19. Revelation 19. And I wanted to cite this only because it connects Christ to God, puts him in the same category as God. There are those that teach that Christ is a lesser being, that Christ is not a God, that Christ is a created being. He's just one of many prophets, many teachers. But here we see in Revelation chapter 19 the, the uh, connection being made between there are many other verses like this in the Bible. And of course, this is talking about Jesus Christ. So we will begin in verse number 9. And he said unto me, talking to John, Write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Again, we're keeping with the theme, God is truth. And verse number um, 10, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou, do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Now, who is on that white horse and who is coming? It's the Lord Jesus Christ, the second advent. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth uh, judge and make war. And so Jesus Christ is also called faithful and true. God is called true, Christ is called truth, Christ is God manifest in the flesh. And then uh, lastly, God's word must of necessity be true. Let's turn to Psalm 30. Psalm 30. written down here. Thirty-three. Psalm thirty-three. Just jump ahead and then we'll go to one thirty. I think it's Proverbs. That's I should have wrote Proverbs there, that first one. Proverbs thirty, verse number five. But since we're in Psalm, we'll read Psalm thirty-three and verse number four. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. What we believe about the word of God is going to shape the way we live. It's going to form our understanding of God. So if we believe that the Bible is not true, 
if the Bible is not infallible, if the Bible is not inerrant, and then other things will be brought into question concerning our faith in God. So let's look at Psalm 130, I think 138. And we'll see what God, uh, what kind of value God places on his word. Psalm 138 and verse number 2. Now we'll go to Proverbs 30, verse 5 in a moment. The Bible says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. So why is God worthy to be praised? Among the many things that we could praise God for, we ought to praise him for his truth. Right? And notice what he says. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God's word has more value even above his name. God's saying, look, this, what I've said is true. You can't deny it. You can't change it. And we can find hope and promise and comfort in knowing that. Amen? Now, let's go to Proverbs 30 real quick, and then we'll jump on to the next point here. Proverbs 30. And you can make a note. Uh, just make the correction in your notes there under number 5. Proverbs 30, verse number 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. I'll read verse 6, even though it's not listed there. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. There's no need to subtract or add to God's word. Amen? Amen. The next thing we're going to talk about is God's wisdom. The wisdom of God. God is the source of wisdom. He is the very God of wisdom. He is all wise and knowing. The Bible says to those who ask, he bestows wisdom. We find that in James chapter 1. Thomas Watson, an old Puritan, said this, and I quote, Men may be wise in some things, but in other things they show imprudence and weakness. But God is the exemplar and pattern of wisdom, and the pattern must be perfect, end quote. Again, it's just consistent with what I've been saying. God does everything perfectly. Amen. We're imperfect, hence the reason why we have to ask for wisdom. The other thing uh, that we must keep in mind is the difference between knowledge and wisdom, and the two are often confounded. Wisdom is the action or fruit of knowledge. So it must naturally follow that we follow the God of all knowledge. God is omniscient, so he's all-knowing. So whatever God chooses to do, he does so perfectly. And God worketh all things after the counsel of his own perfect will. Now again, our understanding of that may be flawed. Why did God do this? Why are we heading in this direction? Why did this happen? But God is all-knowing. I bring up a point, this, uh, this e it's for this evening's service. Uh, Mary and Joseph were living in Nazareth, but the prophecy said that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. So what does God do? In his providence, he puts the burden on Caesar of Augustus to implement a tax, which forced them to leave Nazareth and travel 70 plus miles to Bethlehem to enroll or register in the census and pay their tax. And she was great with child, as you know the story goes, and she gave birth to Jesus in the city of David, Bethlehem, and the story goes on from there. God works everything out perfectly at his counsel. Now, we may not understand it. Um, in a lot of cases, we don't. But God is infinitely wise and perfect in all his doings. And so as we look down through these texts, and we won't turn to all of them just for time's sake, but God is all wise and all knowing. Uh, in wisdom, God created the earth, quoting the Psalm 104, verse 24. God's wisdom is unsearchable, Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Christ is wisdom to the redeemed. Let's go there real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we will begin, <clears throat> I'll begin in verse number 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And jump ahead to verse number 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. God is all wisdom, all wise, all knowing. Christ is all wise, all knowing, as is the Holy Spirit. This is a communicable attribute we see in the last point in James chapter 1, verse number 5. Any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally. It's one thing to have knowledge, but it's another thing to use that knowledge wisely. Amen? Amen. Let's close it out there and get ready for our morning service. Father, thank you for this time. And God, I thank you for your perfect word. God, help us in our limited capacity to understand this world and understand this word and understand the life that you call us to live. God, we desperately need your help. We need your Holy Spirit to move and lead and guide us in this life. God, we do pray for the morning service. The Lord, the word will go forth. Uh, Lord, to edify the saints and bring honor and glory to you. God, help me to sound forth that word with clarity and unction, Father. We pray for those that are traveling as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.